Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Today I want to talk to you guys about what is perhaps the single most important starfighter in the Star Wars galaxy. Some know it by its unit designation number, AA589, others know it by its call sign, Red 5, and some simply know it as Luke Skywalker's X-Wing. Now, Luke has flown multiple X-Wings throughout his career, but AA-589 is definitely the most important one he flew. It was an Incom T-65B X-Wing, a secret prototype fighter made by designers and engineers based on all the experience and data the Incom firm had collected during the Clone Wars. This prototype took the best elements of the Incom Z-95 Headhunter, a single-seater snub fighter, and the Incom ARC-175, a three-seater reconnaissance craft, and kind of merged it all together. When Palpatine rose to power, he tried to nationalize the entire military industrial complex, including corporations like Incom. Now, most of the lead designers and engineers did not really like authoritarian governments, and so they would decide to defect from the Empire, and they would take with them that prototype design or turn into the T-65B. Or at least that's what the lore used to say. I mean, some recent updates in the Disney canon have stated that the X-Wing was actually originally designed for the Imperial Navy. The Empire wanted a rugged single-seater fighter and Incom's design was chosen. It actually went into production, but then the Empire kind of flip-flopped and said that there were some minor problems that needed to get aired out. Unfortunately, that was just a ruse. What really happened was that Senior Fleet Systems had revealed their own entry for the contract, the incredibly cheap TIE Series Starfighter. It was almost a third of the price of the X-Wing, and the Imperial Navy really liked that. Plus, the leader of Senior Fleet Systems had a really close relationship to Palpatine. And so, Income Corporation was kind of screwed. Having commenced production already, they were now stuck with a pretty large shipment of finished and unfinished X-Wings with no buyers. Which is when the Rebel Alliance would contact Income Corporation and agree to purchase all of those ships. This was highly illegal. You weren't supposed to sell to Rebels. And this is probably why a lot of Incom designers and engineers ended up defecting. Now, the earliest X-Wings we saw in operation are found in the hands of Saw Gerrera and his partisans in 5 BBY. But it actually took quite some time for the Rebellion to create a decentralized assembly line for more X-Wings. And so the number of X-Wings available to the Rebellion, especially in the pre-Scarif early Rebellion period, was quite limited. And compared to the rest of the Rebel Starfighter Corps, which was made up of mostly Clone Wars era starfighters, A-Wings and large amounts of refurbished Y-Wings, the X-Wing was far superior. And so the X-Wings were treated as a prized commodity and oftentimes held in reserve units. Or they were used on specific missions that were deemed crucial for the overall Rebellion success. Like when Harrison Dula convinced the Rebel High Command to launch that assault on the Lothal Imperial Armory Complex. Harrison Dula was given 25 fighters, a mix of T-65Bs and Y-Wings, and all ships were lost in the process. And I imagine it took months for the Rebellion to replace those losses. For most routine patrols and missions, units like Phoenix Cell would just utilize the A-Wings and Y-Wings. As a matter of fact, the early Rebellion primarily used the X-Wing for reconnaissance work. It made up 70% of the sorties the X-Wing went on during the early period. And so, prior to the Battle of Yavin, most of the X-Wings actually went to one place in the Rebellion, and that was the Masasi Group, the largest and best equipped unit. Led by General Jando and Donna, the Masasi group generally stayed out of combat and instead focused on keeping the Rebel Alliance leadership like Mon Mothma and Princess Leia alive and out of Imperial hands. Masasi group was headquartered in the Great Temple on Yavin 4, and it was more or less one of the most permanent bases the early Rebellion would use. I'd go as far to theorize that they probably set up some small-scale manufacturing of the X-Wings here. This is something that Bail Organa worked on extensively in the years following the rise of the Empire. He would use his diplomatic resources and cover to scout out new inhabited worlds and turn them into safe worlds. These are places where rebel personnel could rest and relax, their families could hide here along with political dissidents. It was a place where the rebellion manufactured food, clothing, medicine, and weapons and everything else. The world of Crate, for instance, in episode 8 was an old safe world that Princess Leia remembered while her forces fled the First Order. Now we're not exactly sure where Luke's AA-589 was built, but I'm going to say it's probably going to be built in one of the Rebels' decentralized factories rather than an Incom's factory in that initial purchase. Now, prior to Battle of Yavin Red Squadron, the unit that Luke would fly with was deployed to support the efforts of the Rogue One team on Scarif. Red Squadron survived the battle relatively intact because they were delegated to screening the Rebel fleet above the planet rather than supporting the ground team, like Blue Squadron, which was almost completely wiped out. During the battle, Hadron Gall, a former transport pilot, would be operating the call sign Red 5. Gall would be killed by a TIE fighter during the battle, which is what leaves the vacancy for Luke. See, the Rebellion was actually quite well-funded even in the earliest days when Luthen and Ryle and Mon Motha were 
having hushed discussions in that antique shop all those times. With wealthy donors like Mothma and the Organas, ships and weapons were always going to be available. But finding enough personnel to operate them and shoot at the Empire was a little bit more challenging. I mean, you gotta be a little bit arrogant and crazy to fight a galaxy-wide Empire in the first place, especially before Yavin 4. And in that small group of people that are willing to do that fighting, you have to find individuals who are sane enough to be trusted and dependent on, who also at least have some minimal flight experience. You actually don't end up with a lot of people once you put all those filters in. And after a tough battle like Scarif, Red Squadron and Gold Squadron had just about 29 pilots for their 30 starfighters, which is where Luke comes into the picture. Now, you might be wondering why the Rebellion would just give some random kid the keys to an X-Wing, but they were desperate and big Starklighter vouched for Luke. Plus, it's said in Legends that Luke actually was tested on a flight simulator before they let him pilot that X-Wing, and he really impressed the uh, squad leader. But more importantly, Luke was already quite the amateur bush pilot. He flew the crap out of his little Incom T-16 Skyhopper while home on Tatooine. And here's the thing, people really love Incom because all of their products apparently fly in very similar ways, very similar control, uh, control schemes. If you could fly a T-16, learning how to pilot an X-Wing is relatively simple to learn and doesn't really require significant time in the simulator just like the Boeing 737 MAX. Anyway, my guess is going to be that AA-589 was a previously damaged X-Wing that was in for repairs during the Battle of Scarif and was only brought to active duty by the time the Battle of Yavin started. Luke is assigned leader of the fourth flight with Biggs, Darklighter, and Wedge Antilles as his wingmen. There are only four flights in Red Squadron and, you know, the fourth one is the last one. That's important. When the battle starts, the delayed deployments of TIE fighters allow Red Squadron and other pilots to get within striking distance of the surface of the station. But by the time Vader has launched his fighter squadron, Red Squadron starts taking a lot of losses. First, Red Forward John Brannon goes down on Princess Leia because he looks like Kylo Ren's dad. No, but seriously, Red Forward is the first guy to die. Luke, on the other hand, was focused on taking out the defenses on the Death Star's surface, which surprisingly weren't point defense cannons, but actual turbo lasers, which is kind of overkill. These weapons are simply too slow to track a small snub fighter, and it was also tough for an X-Wing to actually damage a turbo laser. It was basically a wash at this point, and since more fighters, more Imperial fighters were arriving on scene every minute, I guess you could say the Rebels were at a huge disadvantage. Time was not on their side. Initially, the idea was to use Gold Squadron's Y-Wings for the trench run and attack on the ventilation shaft. Y-Wings had bigger payloads, but were quite slow and basically fish in a barrel when they entered that trench. When Gold Squadron is personally taken out by Vader, it's time for the first flight led by Red Leader Garvin Dries to attempt an approach. His wingmen are Red 10, Theronet, and Red 12 Puck Nyko. They also get taken down by Vader in the trench, although Garvin does get a proton torpedo off, but it misses its target. The death of Garvin is actually really sad. Him and Antok Merrick, Blue Leader, who also died heroically on Scarif, providing cover for Rogue One, basically established the entire Rebel Alliance Starfighter Corps. They're the ones who chose the T-65B X-Wing. They're the ones who develop all the doctrine and protocols for how to use a Starfighter. And the X-Wing is a huge reason why the Rebellion was so successful in the first place. And Garvin and Merrick actually go way back. They fought in the same planetary defense force during the Clone Wars, and when the Empire rose, uh, that planetary defense force was basically rolled into the Imperial Navy and both of these guys defected. Anyway, the fact that Luke and his wingmen are in Flight 4 is probably what saved them. They were most likely delegated to just an overwatch position where they cover the uh, bombing runs and also try to suppress enemy anti-aircraft fire. And even so, Luke takes a glancing blow to one of his top engines while performing this duty. And R2-D2 suffers a bit of electrical damage as well. But an X-Wing can easily fly with one engine out. Heck, it could probably fly even with two engines out of four out. It's just a very well-designed and reliable ship. Now, when Luke and the rest of Flight 4 make that trench run, they have no support. Pretty much everyone else is gone, and very soon, both of Luke's wingmen are out of the picture as well. Biggs gets shot down, and Wedge is forced to abandon the run after suffering damage to his control surfaces. To make matters worse, the previous blow to Luke's engines also damaged one of his stabilizers. Now, it's kind of hard to understand what exactly that means. On airplanes, stabilizers do exactly what the name says, and so not having that control surface while making a run in a tight trench can definitely be problematic. But then in Legends, a stabilizer refers to a component that's placed in between the fuel line and the engine and that's supposed to regulate the amount of energy going into the engine. Not really sure what's going on here, but the stress levels are rising and to make matters worse, soon after R2-D2 gets hit with a direct shot. And suddenly Luke is all alone. Astromechs are very important in regulating the power systems on the X-Wing, and so whatever issues he had with the stabilizer most likely now just got worse. Luke probably also needs to reroute more power through his aft shields, something that R2-D2 could have easily done, but 
know he's got. Luke's really not in a good situation, and things get even crazier when he gets rid of his targeting computer, but ultimately, Han Solo comes and saves the day and manages to take out Darth Vader's TIE fighter right as he's about to shoot Luke down. And moments later, the young Jedi launches that infamous proton torpedo that ends up killing more than a million Imperials. Honestly, after a fight like that, I would retire AA-589. It's done enough. But the Rebels hardly have any time to celebrate. Directly after the battle, Luke Skywalker heads right back into the action, and not because the enemy has arrived, but because Princess Leia was up to some of her usual princess mischief. The poor girl had watched her entire planet get blown up into smithereens, and she felt somewhat guilty and responsible about this, and she wanted to do something for her people. You see, aside from Luke and Wedge and Tilly's, there was one other pilot who survived out of the 30 who attacked the Death Star, and her name was Yvonne Verlaine. That's a French-ass name. Her call sign was Gold 3, and she must be kind of a badass to survive Yavin. Four. She even got into a tangle with future rebel Aiden Bercio during the battle. Yvonne was an Alderanian, and she had heard whispers in the days after the destruction of her planet that the Empire was beginning a brutal crackdown of Alderanians all across the galaxy. They were literally hunting them down and trying to silence them. Princess Leia heard this news and immediately wanted to leave Yavin 4 and do something for her people. The Rebel High Command, however, had ordered Leia to stay put on Yavin 4 because the Empire placed a massive bounty on her head. Of course, Princess Leia and Yvonne aren't going to listen to that, and so they try to escape the Great Temple on board of a T-1 shuttle. What's left of Red Squadron, which is basically Luke and Wedge at this point, are sent to intercept her and bring her back. Yvonne was smart, though. She and R2-D2 would jerry-rig a component on the top of the ship that looked like a piece of the hyperdrive system. Yvonne would fly into Luke's X-Wing and use his s to nudge that piece off of her ship, which led to her pursuers believing that they wouldn't be able to get away and jump into hyperdrive, which is exactly when she hits the hyperdrive. The next time we see Luke Skywalker, he's pursuing more knowledge about the Jedi, and he ends up on the world of Rogus Voss. He'd be flying the T-65B, which is not only a terrific starfighter, it's actually not terrible for long-range flight thanks to its ARC-175 pedigree. This is why the Rebels used the X-Wing for reconnaissance missions. In the Vragos Vaz system, you also had a Rebel fueling system, and this is where Red Squadron, Blue Squadron, and Yellow Squadron were located during Luke's mission here. Unknown to them, Darth Vader had actually found out the location of Skywalker and was now seeking to bring him back and take him on as an apprentice. Vader would arrive on Vragos Vaz completely alone in his advanced TIE fighter, and the Rebels mistaken him as a scout. But then Vader evades all of their incoming fire, and then quickly wipes out an entire squadron. By this point, Luke and Darth Vader can sense each other through the Force, and Luke realizes it's impossible to bring down Vader with conventional weapons at this point. The man detonated several proton torpedoes with the Force already, and so Luke decided to save his powers and ram Vader, causing both of their ships to fall to the surface. The Rebels would send an entire company of infantry to kill Vader, with air support. And honestly, this should really be made into a live action sequence. I mean, guys, make the Vader movie already and, uh, you know, put Ridley Scott in the director's seat. I mean, who else can handle a biopic from one of the greatest soldiers in galactic history? Now, Luke gets rescued by Han Solo in the Millennium Falcon after that crash. And we find out that Luke wasn't actually piloting his original Starfighter A589. This was another Starfighter. So, so, so the A589 variant is okay, it's intact. Luke would finally be reunited with his original AA-589 X-Wing during the Battle of Hoth many years later. Luke would participate in the battle flying a T-47 snowspeeder before transitioning to the X-Wing, which he would use to easily evade the Imperial blockade overhead, at which point he flies to Dagobah and proceeds to crash his fighter into a swamp. The funny thing is his X-Wing would actually play a really important role in teaching him how to focus on the Force. See, on Dagobah, Luke would find a second mentor in the form of Grandmaster Yoda. It was with him that Luke would learn how to move objects with the Force, starting with small rocks and other easier objects. But eventually Yoda wanted Luke to learn how to lift an X-Wing out of the swamp. Luke would fail, claiming that the X-Wing was too heavy, but Yoda then demonstrates that his approach to the situation was all wrong. It wasn't just about using strength and power to get the X-Wing to move. It was about falling deeply into the Force and strengthening your own connection so that you can move the X-Wing. Once the X-Wing was out of the water and minor repairs were done, Luke goes against the wishes of his Jedi Masters to finish his training and instead seeks out his friends who are now in trouble on the Cloud City on Bespin. During that fateful trip, Luke lose his arm and end up falling down a shaft and would have to be rescued by the Millennium Falcon once again. I wonder if this is what inspired Yoda's escape many years earlier during Order 66. 
They are quite similar. Now, eventually Lando, Luke, Leia would return to Bespin. Lando wanted to rescue his friend Lobot and also sabotage very important Tabana gas mining operations on the planet. Skywalker also left a few things on the planet and wanted them back, like his lightsaber, his X-Wing, and of course his hand. And Leia just wanted to learn how to reverse the process of carbon freezing so that she could get Han back. The mission would be pretty successful and Leia and Lando would ferry a bunch of Cloud City citizens who were arrested by the Empire for resisting them on a stolen Sentinel shuttle and Luke would escape in his AA-589. In between Bespin and Andor, Luke would attempt to search for more Jedi artifacts. He would go to the planet of Sorelia to seek a woman who he was getting visions from. That woman turned out to be Verla, the apprentice of the mad Jedi Farron Barr, who technically was a Padawan, so he shouldn't even have an apprentice. Barr had started a war on Mon Cala in an effort to attract Vader to the planet and kill him. It was kind of a nut job. And Verla, upon figuring out that Luke was Vader's son, tries to attack him. Now, Luke would then go on to the world of Tempe with his X-Wing. He would enter a forgotten Jedi outpost there from the High Republic era and retrieve a yellow lightsaber that would replace the one he lost on Bespin. He actually duels the spirit of the Grand Inquisitor while he's there. It's pretty gnarly stuff. And that yellow lightsaber would be destroyed later by a bunch of kill droids. Luke would then travel to the world of Tatooine and visit the home of Ben Kenobi. He would find another lightsaber that Kenobi had hidden there and also a journal that detailed his life on Tatooine. Luke would still have Red 5 with him when he rescues Han Solo from Jabba's palace. Also Luke Located on Tatooine. After that mission, Luke would return to Dagobah to finish his training and witness the death of Yoda. Now, following the Battle of Endor, which Luke mostly sat out until the very end, Luke would fly his X-Wing to the planet of Pilio in search of more artifacts. He would run into future rebel Del Mico on the world and also grab a Jedi Wayfinder, which would eventually transport him to the world of Octu many years later. But before that happens, Luke starts his Jedi Temple and receives his first prospective student, young Gogurt. But when the little guy is forced to choose the Jedi way or remain with his adopted father, Din Djarin, Gogurt chooses the Mandalorian way. And Luke Skywalker has R2-D2 fly Red 5 and Gogurt back to Mandobro. Oh, it should also be mentioned that Luke had Red 5 when he boards Moff Gideon's ship and just mercs everyone on there. That is a really cool sequence. After Luke screws up big time and gets his Jedi Temple destroyed by Kylo Ren, the Jedi Master goes into exile, this time on the world of Act 2, and he continues researching the first Jedi Temple there. A part of his exile includes taking his trusty X-Wing and then burying it underwater. I think it's a deliberate attempt to sabotage his fighter so he never has to leave the planet. But that should be where AA-589 meets its end. I mean, Luke even uses one of the S-foils as a door for his hut. But then Rey arrives on the planet looking for advice, and Luke decides to gift his old X-Wing to her. He brings the ship to the surface, and Rey spends a good amount of time repairing the ship. She even scavenges a shield paneling from a nearby TIE Whisper wreckage. Rey would pilot Red 5 to the Battle of Exegol, and it would deliver her safely to victory, just like it had so many times before with Luke Skywalker. And after the battle is over, despite all the destruction on Exegol and above, AA-589 survives and makes it back to the Rebel base. And even though it seems like Rey has inherited the Millennium Falcon, an equally worthy and famous starfighter, perhaps a bit more famous, but I'm sure she's still going to have an itch from time to time to get back into the cockpit of that X-Wing. I know there are T-70s and T-85 X-Wings out there by this time, but... Sometimes the classic design, despite being slower, less safe, and less powerful, just are more enjoyable to fly. Just I like Mustangs from the late 60s and the early 70s will always be my favorite. God, those things are beautiful. All right, see you next time, guys.